we're a people-based business. I mean, the only thing that we have to sell is the creativity and the ideas of our people. And our product walks in and out our front door every day. And so um, when we have an opportunity to acquire talented people, interesting clients, we, we look very carefully at that and try to, try to find ways to, see, to say yes to making something work. They said, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll let you through with it, but only if we can take a picture with it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so TSA, TSA got their agents together. I took the picture of the TSA on some guy's phone with him holding the cowbell and the certificate. Oh they threw the thing back in my bag and I sprinted to my gate and I actually barely made my flight. Welcome to the EarFluence Podcast, where businesses and brands can amplify their expertise. I'm Jason Gillikin, CEO of EarFluence, and with me today is Rick French, CEO and founder of French West Vaughn. How's it going today, Rick? Jason, it's always great to see you. It's going great. It's so great to see you too. Um, we're going to talk about building up an agency, hiring, and uh, the crazy thing is there's about 57,000 PR firms in the United States alone. And French West Vaughn at some point was named the world's fastest growing PR firm. So how did you do that? And what's a strategy for building out an agency in multiple locations? Because I believe you have six locations. That's so we'll get, to, we'll get to all of that. At the top of the show, though, you're one of the most interesting, interesting people that, that I know. And I have to ask you about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So... I read that, uh, well, I know that you're on the board of trustees at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. um, this will air in late September. And in October, you're going to be, you're doing something with Melissa Etheridge. Like you and her are being <laughs> yeah. introduced together to something with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. T tell us more about that. So, uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you for the, the kind words. Um, yeah, so I've been on the board of trustees. I thought you were going to ask me about the cowbell and the story about that oh. that, that ran, uh, I guess it was last week, but uh, we can delve into that if you want to. But no, I'm so I'm being honored by the Broadway community, actually, uh, the okay. PATH Fund. The PATH Fund is an organization that on Broadway, anybody who's ever gone to a Broadway show at the end of the show when the... The actors come out and they are raising money for a particular cause. That's that's the PATH Fund. Mm. They raise money across the Broadway ecosystem for a number of charities. And uh, myself and, and the agency have been supporters of the PATH Fund and its efforts to, to support the creative arts for a long time. So I am uh, receiving the PATH Fund's Ambassador of Rock Award. And Melissa Etheridge is receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award. And so the two of us are being honored on October 16th at um, a star-studded event on Broadway. They're closing Broadway for the night. And the, the uh, basically, I mean, everything that's a major production on Broadway will close. The Broadway acting community comes together, the stars and the major shows, to cover. So what they'll do is they'll cover Melissa's music, and they'll wow. do some of their own things that are more pop and rock oriented, uh, things that I will help, you know, choose songs for that I like. And uh, the two of us will uh, be doing that. We're going to be doing some morning television um, uh, nationally that morning to talk about the Path Fund and so on. And the some of the proceeds from the event that night will benefit the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I'm on the board of, the Buddy Holly Education Foundation, which I'm chairman of the board of. And then the Path Fund itself and its various charities. So it's uh, I'm I'm incredibly honored to uh, to be receiving the award and uh, and I can't believe I'm actually sh sharing a stage with Melissa Etheridge. Yeah. Uh, the the other cool aspects is you know there's some other uh, major artists that are coming together um, to to honor both of us. Uh, the few that haven't been announced but by the time this airs that will be. So KT Tunstall is is performing. Uh, Simon Kirk of Bad Company is bringing some all-star guests who are mutual friends of ours uh, together to perform. Alexa Joel, uh, Billy Joel's daughter, is performing. And so you might guess at some other things that might be transpiring that night. Whoa. And uh, and so it's it's going to be amazing. And I um, I'm just feel very blessed to, to be receiving that award. And Melissa was uh, always one of my favorite artists. I think she's incredibly talented. 
she should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We've kind of overlooked her. Uh, hopefully that will change. And so it should be a, a fun evening. That's awesome. Um, the cowbell thing, I missed that. What, tell us about that. <laughs> so so um, somebody got wind, and this is a true story, that, that I own the cowbell, which is um, the, cow, the famous cowbell, not the Will Ferrell cowbell from uh-huh. Saturday Night Live, but the actual cowbell from the Oyster <laughs> Colts, Don't Fear the Reaper. Oh, my gosh. And I've owned this for, oh, gosh, um, uh, more, certainly more than a decade. I think I have to go back and look at it. It's probably been... 13, 14 years. But um, long story short, the um, the story came out that I, I guess um, a, a local blog wrote about the Will Ferrell cowbell and how they were raising money around a replica. And somebody t- tipped off the journalists that I actually own the real cowbell, which I do own and it's been in my office since that time. So they asked if they could do a story on it. I was very reticent because I've never told the story publicly about how it was acquired. And also, I didn't want to be in a situation where I had to worry about its security. I have a lot of rock and roll memorabilia that's Mm -hmm. pretty valuable. Um, And the cowbell is the novelty piece that probably gets more people talking. They ask if they can be photographed with it, people who know the story. (laughs) So I didn't want a situation where I had to worry about locking it up or putting it in a safe deposit box or things like that. And so um, I was a little reticent when I answered the question. They just asked me, do I own it? And I said, yes, I do. And then, of course, they wanted to probe more. So I I had to decide whether I wanted to do the the story. after after agreeing to tell the story, it's taken on a life of its own because all this national media have asked me if they can do stories on it and so on. So the backstory was that um, that many years ago, my friends in Cheap Trick were doing a um, they were playing the Unplayable album, which was a the Sgt. Pepper's mm-hmm. Lonely Heart Club Band album. The Beatles produced that album to be unplayable live. Hmm. I don't know if you know that. They said that this it was too complex to be played live. So Cheap Trick decided they were going to tackle this. Okay. And they they did it, and they did it brilliantly. They did a limited run of shows in New York and Las Vegas, and the final show they were going to do was in Robin Zander, my friend's uh, lead singers of Cheap Trick's hometown, uh, in the Clearwater area. So they, they did this show, and they invited me to come down for the final performance of it. And after the show, they were having an after party, that included some friends of ours, and it, one of whom was Buck Dharma, who was the lead singer of Blue Oyster Cult. And so Buck is a very philanthropic guy. Mm-hmm. He's known for raising money for a number of different causes, including he put on a charity concert for a cancer patient when uh, who, um, who was inspired to stay alive by the song Godzilla. So to cut to the end of this story, at the end of this all-star jam session and set where the backing band was Cheap Trick and you had Donovan performing and Buck and my friend Dave Mason doing his traffic stuff and his solo, Buck's decided he was going to auction off the cowbell from Blue Oyster Colts, Don't Fear the Reaper. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so um, at the urging of Buck's wife, Sandy, I bid on it because I am a collector of music memorabilia and paid – an enormous amount of money for a cowbell um, <laughs> because of a piece of music history. Yeah. And I wanted to protect it, right? And yeah. eventually it either donate to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or some other cause or put it on exhibit. So I I did buy the cowbell and uh, and then there's kind of this crazy story of the next day when I was trying to get through TSA security, I put the cowbell in my carry-on because I went to the concert that night. I had to be back in Raleigh early the next day. So my friend took me to the airport. I was running late for my flight, got to security, and they stopped me and said, I'm sorry, sir, this can't come through. It could be construed as a dangerous weapon, a metal piece. And I said at the time, hey, listen, a couple things. One, I'm going to miss my flight if you make me go back and check my bag. Two, I promise you I'm not going to hit anybody with this. This It's a very famous piece of music memorabilia. And I explained it very quickly to them. And then I showed them the certificate of authenticity from the band and so on for it. And the TSA agent called over the supervisor. Supervisor looks at it, looks and said, wait, this is that cowbell from 
don't fear the reaper? I said, it is. And I showed him pictures with Buck and uh, Robin Zander and Donovan were taking pictures of it because nobody ever thought that it would leave yeah. uh, Buck's possession. And he wanted to make sure it was in a good home. And anyway, long story short, they said, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll let you through with it, but only if we can take a picture with it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so TSA, TSA got their agents together. I took the picture of the TSA and some guy's phone with him holding the cowbell and the certificate. No way. They threw the thing back in my bag and I sprinted to my gate and I actually barely made my flight. And so so I've had the cowbell for uh, among my music memorabilia for a number of years. And so the story came out and it's just gotten bigger and bigger over the last week and a half or two weeks. And so I never really wanted to do interviews around it anyway, because I don't want people to say, sure. how much did you pay for the cowbell? Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter. But the fact is, yes, I do. I do have that. So I, that's why I thought you were going. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, let's make sure we get a clip of that for social media. y'all. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, all right. So we wanted to talk about building out a, an agency, um, building out in multiple locations, keeping the, the team culture intact, all those different things. So um, 1997, you formed French West Vaughn. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what French West Vaughn is now, uh, PR, marketing, branding, that kind of that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, we've we've been around now for what twenty six plus years, and um, you know it started as Richard French and Associates, and as as purely a PR firm. And I, I uh, several years later acquired Weston Vaughn, which is a well known regional advertising agency. And rather than lose the equity in the Weston Vaughn brand that I had just acquired, we just put the brands together to form French West Vaughn. And as you mentioned, uh, over the years, we've received you know a lot of accolades, um, fastest growing agency in the world, number one agency in the world for people who like the people they work with. Oh wow. Um, um, That's a big one. It is. We, and, and then 30 national or global agency of the year honors uh, were the reigning uh, 2022 global PR agency of the year as voted on by a panel of the nation's top journalists mm. who are the people that we're pitching for stories, right? Yeah. So um, we've received a lot of recognition. We're, we're a fully integrated public relations, public affairs, advertising social media and digital marketing agency. Gotcha. And we're, and we're really agnostic. While we started as a PR firm, um, we, since day one, my mandate to my team was that we need to bring the best thinking and ideas forward for our clients, regardless of whether we had the capability to execute those elements in-house or we needed to outsource. And so the idea is that to look at a client's business challenge and reverse engineer the solution, not to the, the the tools that you have in your toolbox, but what will actually work to accomplish their business goals. And then, you know, hopefully we have all built out those things so that we can do those things in-house for them. But if we can't, that's fine too. Yeah. The idea is to help them solve their most critical business challenges and, and meet their goals. And so that's what we've uh, we've tried to do over the last uh, 26 years. You know, we've grown to become the most acclaimed and the largest agency in the history of the South or the Southeast. Mm. Um, you know, we've ranked as the largest agency in the Southeast region for 21 straight years. And that's really a testament to not so much to size or, or acquisition strategies, but just to the good work that our team is doing yeah. on behalf of their clients. And so, um, you know, that's that's kind of what we do. And we've, we've made acquisitions, we've grown, and uh, we also serve as kind of an agency holding company so that you have the French West Vaughn brand, but then we have you know, Fetching Communications, which is now FWV Fetching in Tampa. And we have the Millershin Group in Detroit. And we have CGPR in Boston. And we have Pre-Productions, my film and television production company in Los Angeles. And so we allow these um, these agencies to operate under their own brand, under the French West Vaughn umbrella, AMP3 in New York. I don't want to forget them. And so that model has worked very well for us. And yeah. uh, we try to provide the fuel for their growth and try not to tamp out the thing that made them worth acquiring in the first place. Gotcha. And so you go to the, the website, French West Farm website, it says Detroit, New York, Los Angeles, Boston, Raleigh, obviously. But I think there's six overall. Yeah. 
Tampa. That's it. Um, so that's from acquiring different companies. It is. Okay. Gotcha. So the strategy for that then in, in acquiring these companies, was it to be on more of a national scale? Was it to add services? What was the, when did it start and what was the thinking behind it? Yeah. We started acquiring firms. I mean, when you go back to acquiring Weston Vaughn even, right? Yeah. To, to create the, the current incarnation of French West Vaughn. Um, so I've always believed in, first of all, you acquire talented people, right? And and bring their skill sets in-house. In these acquisitions, they're also bringing clients. Yeah. So that certainly uh, you have to have the ability to pay for the people. And so we, we try to do look at acquisitions through two different lenses. One is the bolt-on lens. Are they adding something that we either don't, previously didn't offer ourselves, or we weren't focused on mm. so that we're, we're, we're adding to our capabilities and skill set. The other is accreting to your existing strengths. And do they have something that, um, that adds to something you're already good at and that just builds further on it? We're a people-based business. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that we have to sell is the creativity and the ideas of our people. And our product walks in and out our front door every day. Mm. And so um, when we have an opportunity to acquire talented people, interesting clients, we we look very carefully at that and try to try to find ways to see to say yes to making something work. Yeah. So I'm always um, I'm always looking for the right opportunities to partner with the right people. And and so I think some of that is born out of the fact that you know I, I have my own capital fund so I I have investments in a number of different entertainment, sports and media companies. And I employ the same discipline there. You know, are you working with smart people? Do they have good ideas? Do I think I can add value to what they're already doing? And if you can check all those boxes, then financially the thing generally takes care of itself. And that's right. just kind of how we look at it. Gotcha. Okay. So um, in expanding out to all these different locations, there's cultures already in place at, at these places do you let them keep the same culture? Do you want to mold it with French West Vaughn's culture? Like, how does that all work with the teams as you're acquiring these companies? So, you know, every agency that you acquire has its own culture. Yeah. Um, you don't want to tamp that out. That's what made it attractive in the first place. Yeah. But you also want them to align with your culture so that you, you work holistically. So I think it's a little bit of both. You take the best practices of the things that they do well, and you try to continue to, to nurture those. And then I think you also look for the opportunity to make them feel a part of what the bigger agency and, and that what you do that has made you know our firm special. So, so we do both. Um, it, it isn't an either or in any way. Um, and, and I think... Um, we have a mindset of treating our clients as our business partners and their goals are our goals. Mm -hmm. And so we want to instill in those agencies that we acquire how important that is that they think the same way. Yeah. And I think we've been we've been generally successful in doing that. You know, and if there isn't a culture fit, we've had a few instances where acquisitions where you know, we thought it might be the right fit, but we got into it and found out it really wasn't. Mm. We've either divested or we've parted ways. How come, uh, like even, how come the, it, the, it wasn't a fit? Well, you know, I think the biggest challenge you have in an acquisition is that um, people who have been in business a long time themselves like to do things the way they like to do things. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it's been what's held them back. Oh, yeah. And if they can't evolve and change and align with what you're looking to do, then very often you have to think carefully about whether they're ever going to come around to that. Mm -hmm. We've had that before, you know, and, and um, you know, there's an old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. That's right? true. Yep. So if you, you acquire a firm but they want to, and, and they say they want to grow, but then they continue to operate the way they always have and they can't move along and evolve, 
then you may find that you're never really going to grow unless you can either change the people or you just culturally decide there's not a fit and you figure out another solution. And um, and we've lived through that. I think anytime you do an acquisition, there's um, there is the potential for that to happen, which is why you have to do the right due diligence, the right vetting yeah. process, and so on. But sometimes it's just hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. And... Um, uh, and in other times, you have firms that really want to learn what made your firm so successful. And they come along very easily and willingly, and then you see a lot of growth. Right. That's awesome. So what about the the other way then where you acquire a company and you realize, oh, they're doing some things better than, than us? Yeah. Um, any particular examples that you can think of with that where one of the companies you acquired uh, were you just learned a, a lesson right away about culture or clients or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, I think it's a, almost evolutionary. I, yeah. I'll tell you, through the pandemic, everybody had to operate differently. I think our, our New York aff- affiliate AMP3, when we acquired them, they were maybe 30% of the size they are today. Wow. They have grown astronomically through the pandemic. They learned to pivot in a tough market in New York. Um, they keep winning high-profile clients. They are doing it in ways that um, that I think are pretty innovative. And I think we see some of the things that they're doing and the way they've been able to operate virtually in a way that wasn't necessarily our own culture, um, gave up their office space in New York to work virtually and haven't found a need to go back into it. Um, Not my mindset, right? I'm I'm more traditional in that regard, but they're showing us how effective it could be and how it lowered their cost bases and increased their profits, which obviously are a good thing for for all of us. It can't be cheap Um, in New York. It can't be cheap, right? It's not, right? (laughs) And then then it became how valuable is the actual, and we have an office. It's just we downsized to a much smaller space. It's it's used more for meetings mm-hmm. when it's necessary. Um, the clients are all over the world, so there we have people always traveling anyway. It's not like many clients were coming into that office, and so therefore, it's made us look at it and say, well, how often are our clients actually in our office anymore versus where we're going to meet them? Yeah, and so you know, just it makes you think a little bit differently about the way that you approach business. And so I think that there's, um, there's always things that, uh, that you learn from other people, right? If you're aligning yourself with smart people, hopefully you're open to ways that they also do business. Yeah. And you, um, you, know, you, you try to learn from each other. I think that's the best, you know, I think that's, that's a life lesson, but it's oh, also sure. a business lesson for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so for hiring then, you know, when somebody at AMP3 in New York is looking to hire a person, how does French West Vaughn get involved? Like how does the Raleigh division get involved yeah. with hiring somebody in New York or, or, or do you? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we, we have a centralized human resource function. And gotcha. so, so we, um, we have our uh, chief people officer involved in the vetting of this and, and making sure that the associates understand kind of protocols and what we're looking for and the expectations. So we go through that process with the general manager or the presidents of our, of our uh, local offices and making sure that everyone is aligned. And, uh, you know, as I said, we're a talent-based business, so we're looking for people all over the country. It doesn't matter necessarily where they are. In a perfect world, we would like them aligned with one of our physical locations uh, so that they're not an outlier somewhere and we have the ability to bring them in for meetings or new business pitches or whatever is important. But, you know, it, it comes down to what they can bring to the table and how we feel we can effectively use them. Yeah. What's the mistake that you've made? Um, let's say... I can't. I don't remember when you started acquiring companies, mm-hmm. um, but let's say it was 15 years ago or so. What's a mistake that you made 15 years ago that you wouldn't make today? That you that you learned from in acquiring companies and in culture or whatever it is in in um, bringing these companies together? Yeah, we acquired um, we acquired a, a firm in New York probably 20 plus years ago. And we just um, we just could not bring the founder who had run the agency for a long time around to 
doing business any differently than the way she had always done it. Mm. And we ultimately just decided to, we were so frustrated in working with, trying to work with her and deal with her that we literally, I literally walked away and gave her back the majority of the thing to not be in business with her anymore. Oh, wow. Even though we'd paid to acquire it. Yeah. That's how much we did not thought that life was too short to be dealing with really difficult people where anything you say has a contrarian point of view, right? And um, and we saw a turnover in that office that we thought we might be able to fix because, again, employees would get frustrated with her, right, and wouldn't stay, and the turnover rate was really high. And we thought that's not our firm. That's not who we are. Yeah. And that's not how uh, we have extraordinarily long tenures with our associates and very little turnover, you know, generally. And so I think that um, when we found that we couldn't change the way that they were doing business, we just said uh, – we don't want to be in business with you. And it didn't matter how much we had invested, that the cost of lost time and energy and trying to fix things just wasn't worth it to us. Yeah. So the point is you have to do really good vetting up front. Yeah. You have to make sure through the process that there's a, that there's people are of like mind and like desires and so on. When we made our acquisition of uh, the Millershin Group in Detroit, and had our meetings and sit downs. I knew from day one that there was a cultural fit. That there were. I grew up in Detroit. These were yeah. people that had a Midwest mentality. That had to be special and for you. It, it, very special. It, it yeah. really has been. And um, and there was a sensibility and uh, a hard work ethic and all of those things I could sense from day one. And we knew exactly what we wanted to do what we wanted to accomplish there. And so it was a very easy decision to move forward. But there have been yeah. times where we've looked at opportunities, got into it, and just felt like we wouldn't all be rowing in the same direction and therefore it wasn't going to be a good fit. Yeah. Now, I mean, sometimes people are just interview superstars, right? For and sure. when you're chatting with somebody, like they're putting on their their best face, um, they're putting on like their, their high energy. And then when you get down to business, I mean, maybe it's not the right fit. Have you had that situation as well? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I think we've all had that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, we've seen that several times, um, not just through acquisitions, but through a uh, hiring process and yeah. so on. Yeah. And, you know, sure. I think that anytime you hire someone, there are rel there's, there's relative unknowns, right? You see the resume on paper. You they interview well. There's something that made them successful, but you have to look for the, you know, you have to look for the little things in a resume. Have mm -hmm. they jumped around a lot? Have there been short tenures at places? You know, uh, just there's little things that might be triggers for you, but you ultimately don't know. You can hire some, the, somebody who looks great on paper. They interview great. They get in, and for whatever reason. They don't work for you and your needs, uh, or the clients don't. They don't resonate with the clients, and so you're in the human capital business. And so uh, there's going to be times where there's fits. So there's going to be times where they're where they're not. The way I look at my firm and always have is we have a rehabilitate, don't decapitate policy. Okay, and what that means is that. When you hire someone, you generally may have a need. You think you have a need yeah. at, that they're going to fill. They get in there and you might find that their skill sets are not perfectly aligned with what your actual need is. Sure. So how do you approach that? Does that mean you get rid of them and you, and many firms do, and they go find somebody that fits their actual need? Or do you look at what they do well and you tailor the skill sets to where they can make the greatest contribution to your agency. We're a mosaic of skill sets. Mm. We have to fit the puzzle pieces together to get the best outcomes. None of us are great in everything. And so I look at it as even if you haven't found the exact right fit for your immediate need, needs change very quickly in our business. 
So find the things they do well, lean into those, use them in a way where they can be effective, maybe not for that particular client, but for other clients, and knit it together. That's what makes a great agency. It is not just filling the need at a particular moment because almost nobody will fit that criteria from day one. They will have some deficiencies. Yeah. And so don't harp on what they don't do well. Nurture what they do do well. Yeah, that is awesome. As you think about your six locations and different divisions, I imagine it's hard to create some sort of brand cohesion with all of this. And is that the case? And then do you ever get the teams together um, mm-hmm. in a retreat or something like that? Like, yeah, how does that, that, work? that is the biggest challenge for sure. A cohesive brand is the hardest thing to do when you're allowing the agency brands that you acquired to sit and under the umbrella as their own brands. We try to have um, certain branding that binds mm. it together, you know, so they're all an FWV agency and part of that. But in the end, um, it, it does make it more challenging. The flip side to that is that there are firms that have the mentality, especially the large agency holding companies, of making an acquisition. And as soon as an earnout is complete, they're turning the brand into their own brand. So then it just becomes Edelman or Ogilvy brands in these, you know, in these cities. I just believe in not in not stamping out what made these firms unique. Yeah. And that their name in their market is as powerful or more powerful than our agency brand coming in uh, because they're local. Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing business with people in the local markets in many cases. So we choose to employ a, a different strategy. And it served us well. But, you know, the, um, the, the drawback to it is, is the lack of a singular cohesive brand in that regard. So we have to work a little bit harder to tell the story of how um, all these firms knit together and people. Yeah. I was reading uh, the Bob Iger biography uh, recently, and uh, one of the challenges was um, acquiring Pixar when mm-hmm. Disney acquired yeah. Pixar, in that Pixar had such a strong brand. And one thing that was really important to the Pixar team was keeping the Pixar email addresses and yeah. making sure that they are Pixar employees yeah. rather than Disney employees. Yeah. And so for, for French West Vaughn, is it I'm calling from AMP3? Is yeah. it or is it I'm calling from French West Vaughn? Or do they have AMP3 emails? Or? They have they have AMP3 emails, but they also have behind those emails, they're all part of they're all part of our internal emails. So you have a sub FWV email so that they're getting all the group emails that we want to share as a, as a cohesive company. Gotcha. But no, it's coming It's coming from an AMP3 email or a TMG email or a FWV fetching email or, or whatnot. That's so awesome. we, we, tr- we try to, you know, we try to let them um, maintain that identity. Yeah. And then do, does everybody get together at some point? Yes, we do. We t- tend to get together certainly around the holidays. We bring people together, uh, company holiday celebration and things like that. We don't tend to have an annual retreat. Our people are traveling so much to our various offices and yeah. locations that we're always seeing each other. Okay. So it's not as if we don't have that that uh, in-person interaction we do. But we try to bring everybody together at the end of the year to celebrate the year and um, do some strategic planning for the next year and and just um, celebrate in the successes. Cool. As you think about next acquisitions, do you look at the map? Are you thinking like, oh, we don't have a presence in Texas or London or anything like that? Or are you looking for specific services? Like, what's the the strategy yeah. with that? Uh, it, it, it's not geographic driven per se. Okay. It is. Uh, it tends to be either you're bolting on to your existing competency or you're looking at an opportunity where, where you feel like you might have not be as focused. Mm-hmm. Like the, when we bought TMG, yeah, Detroit was great, but French West Vaughn has largely been known as a, uh, a B2C firm, mm-hmm. you know, has a great reputation as a business to consumer firm. So sometimes when we would get into new business pitches, People say, oh, you're more of a B2C than B2B. Well, the Millerson Group was a B2B firm. 
right? So we we wanted to bolt on to that and say, you know, have a dedicated firm focused on business to business marketing. Yeah. And so that was the reason. The fact that they happened to be in Detroit to me was a personal plus. But they could have been anywhere and we would have found it equally as attractive. Yeah. So you know, does London or Austin, for example, hold appeal? Interestingly enough, we've looked at opportunities in both, for example. We've, we used to have an office in Dallas. So right opportunity, right people, we would look at it. But I would say the same thing in North Dakota or Wyoming or wherever we could find really great, talented people who can bring uh, great ideas to our clients. Awesome. Um, last question uh, about this topic, then I want to ask you about your movie. Sure. Um, so we're a, a B2B um, you know, marketing podcast, yeah. and you've mentioned a lot of mistakes that, that you've made, um, that French West Vaughn has, has made. Well, hopefully what, not a lot, but uh, you mentioned, you mentioned some. some. <laughs> you mentioned some. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those. What's the, what's the biggest mistake that, that you've made or seen in, in marketing in general? Um, that that you can think of that you're willing to share. Oh gosh, <laughs> I mean, it can be general. Um, it can be a story. I think that um, if the only thing you have in your toolbox is a hammer, then a nail is the execution to everything, right? Yeah. I think that what so often happens in marketing in general is that. If that's a service you have to sell, that's what you're going to push. And that's never the right approach. If you're going to be a business consultant to to clients, then you have to be agnostic as to the solution. And so, so often we will hear from a, uh, a company, yeah, we worked with this firm before and, you know, we, we implemented this particular solution, and it didn't really work for us, which is why we're looking for a new partner. And it was very obvious to us, well, that isn't the right solution to your problem. Yeah, public it's relations. Yeah, public relations inherently is not. It's a reputation management discipline. It can build brand equity. There's a lot of things that public relations can do very well, and it can be a sales driver, but it is not a substitute for advertising when you need direct-to-consumer sales to take place quickly. Mm -hmm. But many companies will, will defer to it because they see it as less costly than advertising. Gotcha. Well, okay. You can't rely on the media reporting on a new product launch everywhere you want it to be the next day if you need sales in the next quarter. So you may decide, determine, well, we want to do PR because you see it being less costly. But if it doesn't drive sales, what does it accomplish for you? Yeah. Right? And so very often you get clients that are looking at it through the lens of what can they afford, not what will achieve the greatest business results, what will give them a true best ROI. You see that happen all the time. Right. Right. And it's an agency's job to get them to pivot off of that, to understand that our job is to help you solve your business challenge. And so you have to reverse engineer the solution. Mm -hmm. So that would be the mistake that I see a lot yeah. in business. Yeah. No, I mean, I, that's, that's tough too. When, when you're in business and you want that particular client, yeah. um, you, and you have the, you have one of the things that they might need, but you know, it's not the perfect solution. That's a, that's a challenge. I was actually just talking to somebody last night, um, who's trying to pitch a social media product and he's like, should I start a podcast about it? I was like, well, you could, but the fastest path for you is to be a guest on other podcasts. Right, which is right. not really a service that we offer, um, but it's probably the best thing for for you to do, anyway. But that's tough when you've got that hammer, <laughs> right? What? Well, but you're giving them the right kind of business advice, yeah. and that will come back to you yeah. as a result of doing the right thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. The, you. You'll you'll get you'll you'll get opportunities that come to you from being a good friend and a good counselor to them. Right. And that's how we look at things. Even if we're not the right fit, we'll refer it out or suggest that they look at things differently. And maybe they come back to us, you know, down the road. Yep, I agree. 
Um, so I want to ask you about your, your movie because uh, I saw in Rally Magazine yeah. this piece about Not Without Hope. Yep. Um, yeah, tell us about it. So it's been a 14-year, um, I'd like to say labor of love. I'm not sure that that would be the right way to describe 14 it. 14 uh, years. 14 years of trying to get this movie made and tell the story. Um, you know, I um, our firm began working with Nick Schuyler, the survivor of a boating accident in the Gulf of Mexico, just days after he was um, he was rescued. And the backstory has a, a bit of a, a rally tie to it. Uh, one of the players, uh, so, so there's four friends who left on a fishing trip in late February of 2009. They were going 70 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico to, uh, to an old shipwreck site that was known as a great fishing spot. And they were in a 21-foot boat, very mm. small to go that far out. And they knew that a storm was approaching. Uh, what they didn't know is that it would be the worst storm to hit the Gulf of Mexico in 25 years up to that point. But um, they went out on this trip and they they made a fateful error in that their anchor got stuck. And rather than cutting the anchor, they retied the anchor from the bow of the boat to the stern and tried to gun the engine and to dislodge it as the storm was coming in and they knew that they needed to get back to shore. And instead of the anchor releasing, the boat lurched up in the air and flipped into the, flipped them into the water. And oh. it started, you know, 43 hours of hell oh. uh, where the storm is coming. They had no emergency beacon on the boat to alert anyone to where they were. Their cell phones wouldn't work. You can't flip a boat back over when you're in the water. It doesn't matter if you had two NFL players. Uh, they were former uh, teammates on the Tampa Bay Bucks. One player is a former NC State grad, Corey Smith, who uh, was playing for the Detroit Lions at the time. Another was Marquise Cooper, who was a um, University of Washington grad, All-American, who was um, playing for the Oakland Raiders. But they had been on the Tampa Bay Bucks Super Bowl winning team as Tampa, mm. as Tampa t- uh, teammates. And they were, um, this was the off season and um, they regularly went to the gym in the off season and they got to know Nick Schuyler. Um, who was a personal trainer, and he was working out with them and working with them. And Nick had invited, um, when there was a last-minute cancellation, his best friend, uh, a former University of uh, South Florida teammate of Nick's. They had both played college football. So there were four football players. So these are big, strong guys. Yeah. But you can't flip a boat back over when you have no leverage in the water. Yeah, And sadly, um, sadly, one by one... um, they passed um, as, as family realized they were gone and they sent out a search and rescue. The U.S. Coast Guard were heroic in their efforts to try to find them against the storm that was beating back their boats and helicopters and so on. And so, um, so this is that story of, of survival, of um, loss and so on. So... Three of the guys uh, passed one by one through uh, hypothermia. Uh, finally, Nick Schuyler himself was discovered after the storm broke when the U.S. Coast Guard sent its biggest ship up from Cuba to try to cut off the coast of Cuba to cut through a storm. And he was discovered with literally, they, they didn't think he would have, his body was shutting down, that he would not have lasted another hour himself. And he was dramatically rescued, and this is his story. Wow. And so, um, you know, we worked with with Nick and the family from uh, just days after the accident when there were questions about what happened out there. Uh, everybody wanted a piece of him. They wanted to know, um, you know, what had transpired. And there was, you know, we, I talked with the family. I, I took the assignment on myself because there were conspiracy theorists out there who were throwing out you know, questions about why he lived and why the others died and did he have something to do with their deaths, just heinous things oh. that I found so horrible on social media that I felt like this is a challenge that needed a particular level of expertise. And so I personally started working with Nick and we didn't do any interviews for six months. He had such PTSD that um, he was just not even capable of talking about the horrors of seeing his friends die and um, uh, and so on. So ultimately, um, we decided to grant one interview. 
Uh, at least we thought it was going to just be one interview and decided to do it with HBO Real Sports, which I saw today, actually a story that after 29 seasons, this is going to be the final season of that show. Oh, wow. But um, we sat for an interview with Bernie Goldberg. It was it was taped uh, down in uh, in Tampa. That became the season premiere in 2009, which was about six months after the accident. Uh, it won them an Emmy uh, for Best Sports Reporting. And that just set off all of Hollywood and book publishers wanting a, a, a full account of it because you could only tell 22 minutes of the story. And so uh, after a lot of discussions with the family and Nick, we decided to write a book. Um, that book became a New York Times number one bestseller the day it was released. Uh, there was an Oprah Winfrey special about it. The, we appeared on Good Morning America and um, Larry King Live and so on. So it shot to the top of the charts. Yeah. And, uh, and, is that, it also called Not Without Hope? It's called Not Without Hope. Okay. And uh, it was translated into multiple languages worldwide. Um, because of the NFL backdrop, here we are. And yeah. the, we're recording this on the night that the NFL season is opening with the Detroit Lions right. playing. So there's this whole kind of symmetry here. The book became, you know, a, a bestseller on, the, on day one. By the end of the first day, it was already at the top of the, of the charts. And so every studio in Hollywood came calling. And we listened to um, pitches for it. We weren't sure we wanted to do a movie. Nick wanted the chance to tell a full story in the book because, yeah. again, you can only do so much in television. Yep. But ultimately, um, it's been a crazy 13 years. So a year, it, the book was released on the one-year anniversary of the accident itself. And originally it was Mark Wahlberg and his closest to the whole productions pitched me and he um, wanted to develop it and so on. So we talked to him and uh, again, we, every studio in the world was pursuing this. So originally Mark was attached and he was going to produce and star in it. That was 2010 at this point and that was the year both The Fighter and Ted came out. Mm -hmm. And so it just didn't get developed. So the option expired. I took it back, listened to pitches um, again from everybody. Ultimately, there was a studio relativity that was very high flying at the time. It had just made the social network and so on. And it had some ideas. So we aligned with them. They quickly went out to Dwayne Johnson. We got Dwayne attached to star in it. Dwayne was producing with me, which I'll come back to that in a second. And um, we were developing it. We hired a screenwriter. We were moving towards production. And then Relativity went into bankruptcy. And it was crazy because they were doing so well, but they had taken on a lot of debt yeah. over the years. And they were backed by hedge funds. And the hedge funds realized that they were worth more broken up with the value of their catalog than they were to be allowed to remain as a studio. Okay. And so that put the project into limbo. It put it into the bankruptcy courts. We had to work to get the rights back and everything else. And during that time, Dwayne was already the biggest star in the world. Uh, we lost his window to shoot it. And so we had to get it set up again. So I went back out after I reacquired the rights and the script from the studio in bankruptcy and I set it up with uh, Kevin Plank of Under Armour's production company. We were working to get it repackaged. Uh, and then Kevin came out with, with comments in support of Trump mm. when Trump was elected. And that alienated him with the Hollywood community yeah. that tended to be more left-leaning. So nobody wanted to do a project that he was attached to. Oh. As, even though he's a billionaire and was involved in the NFL and football through Under Armour and everything else. So this is three companies so, so far. So we had to wait for that that window to expire on the option. Took it back again. Heard How long are these options? Again. Like six months, a year? No, nah, they were generally a year or sometimes they had extension options. And in Kevin's yeah. case, his company paid to extend it. And uh -huh. anyway, it was just a long, torturous story. So... Um, so we ended up taking it back and we found a UK-based production company that wanted to be involved. They brought us a financier who would finance the movie. I'm sorry, during there was a period when we had uh, Sam Worthington attached a star in it. So we went from Mark Wahlberg to Dwayne Johnson to Sam Worthington. Sam was attached with the UK-based one. 
And then he got called in to to do um, the sequels to Avatar, hmm. right? And so his availability became outside the window that we were going to shoot. So we got Miles <laughs> Teller attached. Gracious. Miles Teller was attached and we were ready to start production. We were weeks from starting shooting in the Dominican Republic and COVID hit. Oh. All production had to be shut down. Miles then Top Gun 2 came out. He became hugely in demand. Um, and he wasn't available when we were ready to restart finally. He had too, too many other commitments we would have had to wait. So anyway, we have gone through this crazy evolution. We finally shot the movie this summer in Malta where they had shot um, Gladiator, where um, they'd shot Jurassic Park. Malta has the best outdoor water tanks in the world. Okay. And we had to thread a needle between a possible director strike <laughs> a writer strike that still is going on and a threatened SAG strike. In all of that, we got the movie shot there in Malta because of the the water tanks and the tax credits that are available. Uh, Zachary Levi, Shazam, um, is the star of the movie. Uh-huh. Josh Jamel is playing the uh, Coast Guard captain. Oh wow! Uh, Joe Beth Williams from Kramer versus Kramer and Poltergeist fame plays Nick's mother, who is central character in the story. And we shot a tremendous movie. I mean, it is emotionally devastating. Yeah. Um, Joe Carnahan, uh, who is an A-list director, um, uh, rewrote the script himself. He directed the movie. He um, He's known for the gray um, smoking aces. He wrote Bad Boys for Life. You know, he's a proficient writer, really in demand writer as well as director. He's from Michigan. Okay. Uh, so a little tie back to that. Um, we collect um, pretty quickly. And so, um, so the movie has been shot. The director's cut as uh, we're recording this. I will see the director's cut tomorrow for the first time. Oh my gosh. It's a two hour movie. He called me to tell me, listen, I've been the lead creative producer on this project. Um, he said, it's not an easy movie to watch. It's not a happy story, even though there is a bit of a happy ending and that someone was discovered to tell the story. It's a hard movie because three people died. Yeah, And he is a survivor. He's not a hero. He wasn't able to bring any of his three friends back as hard as he tried. So the heroism is really in the United States Coast Guard and their efforts to not give up and to find a survivor against all odds. And the movie, you know, being there on set, overseeing production was a hard thing to make because Malta's beautiful, right? It's a great place to shoot it um, and so on. But we were in those water tanks at night for weeks on end with these guys just getting beaten up by waves and the elements that we created for it. We are taking the theater goer into the water with them. So underwater cameras and things where you are being thrown under those waves and so wow. on. And um, you're gonna. It's very immersive. So the th when you see the movie, you're gonna feel like these guys felt. Was Nick there? Yes, he was. We um, I brought Nick over, Nick and his wife, and um, uh, they were part of it for about a week to meet the actors to who were portraying them and so on. It is an emotionally devastating yeah. movie. Joe Carnahan has been telling everybody it's the best thing he's ever made. You know, he's nominated for an Oscar for The Gray. It is, I've, I saw 28 minutes of it strung together of various scenes to get an idea about six or eight weeks ago. And I was just, my jaw was on the floor. Wow. Um, so I'm, I'm anxious to see uh, what the full director's cut is going to be. It's about a two hour movie at this point. You know, I, um, I'm proud of what we made and trying to honor the memory of these guys who were lost. The, my goal was to, in making the movie, was to not just focus on how they died, but how they lived and bring them back to life in some way, which I hope we've accomplished. So the movie will be out next year. 
Um, it'll have a worldwide theatrical release. It's been bought in every country around the world. Um, wow. It's going to be a major, major motion picture. It will probably air, although it's not set in stone, it, air, it'll probably run in theaters around this time next year to lean into the start of the college football and NFL okay. seasons yeah. because of the backstory. But then interestingly enough, in this whole circle of things, um, Dwayne Johnson and I are producing a documentary together on it because he's so passionate about this. We, um, uh, Dwayne is, um, well, we, we started this process with uh, Oscar-nominated um, documentary maker Stephen Cantor and his production company out of New York. He was, he made most of the ESPN 30 for 30s that you've seen, mm -hmm. um, claimed documentary um, filmmaker. And so, we're doing a documentary version of this. It was originally set up at Netflix and then Netflix had subscriber numbers drop and they canceled a bunch of projects, including ours, that weren't already in production. But we found third-party financing as a, the biggest budget documentary ever in history, actually, um, that was raised to make this. So we are um, nearing the completion of principal photography for that. So the documentary version of the same film with recreations and so on, because we don't have the original, um, obviously, photography for what happened out there, is being completed. And so there will be two versions of Not Without Hope um, coming out next year. One will be um, called Four Down. That's the documentary that Dwayne and I are producing that will have a Great name. Um, that'll have a festival run at the major film festivals around the world before it probably will land in a limited release in theaters uh, so it qualifies for Oscar consideration and so on. And then we'll probably go to a streamer, uh, probably Netflix because they have a right of first refusal on it and they check in with us, you know, every week. And then, uh, and then the supporting feature film or, or the complimentary feature film will be um, available in the theaters. So wow. two versions of this story after 14 years of, of trying to tell the story and get it made by the time it comes out. And so it was gratifying. It was exhausting to make a major motion picture like this. Um, the funny thing is you get it made, you get it shot, and there's so much more work to do because – you know, when I see that director's cuts, I'll be turning in my notes on what I think we need to, you know, have changed or make adjustments on and things like that. The other producers who are involved in the project will do the same thing. Um, you know, we'll work with our director, but then you're working with your distributors on a release and then you're setting the release and you're doing all the marketing around the film itself. Um, you have, there'll be announcement, let's see, Tomorrow, today opens the Toronto International Film Festival. Tomorrow, we're releasing the first look pictures from this in an exclusive with Hollywood Reporter. Mm -hmm. They're running something. Uh, we have, we're announcing, I think it's tomorrow, we're announcing um, our distribution deals around the world. We're holding back the U.S. announcement, but we're um, intentionally announcing some of the territories. So there's a series of things in the marketing of the film and the build up to it to build excitement for it um, that take place. And then they'll set, you know, we'll work with our distributors to set global release dates for it. And then you've got all the things that have to happen around that. We're presuming obviously the strike will get settled at some point. Our actors will be able to engage and promote the film. But then will be, you know, our expectation for this one is uh, for the feature is that most likely we would expect to either be in competition or out of competition at Cannes next year. Mm. Wow. Um, depending how we decide to do it with our, especially since it's got this global release to it. The original plan to for Four Down was for it to premiere at Sundance because Stephen Cantor's a Sundance fellow. He's won Sundance before as best director and best film. So he has a slot there for it. We just don't think it's at this point that we're going to be quite ready for Sundance because it's taken us a little longer in working with the Coast Guard to get some stuff we need. Yeah. But maybe. So if we don't end up at Sundance next year, we would likely either go to Cannes with the doc as well or go to Tribeca. Um, it'll be one of the major film festivals for sure as an opener. Um, of course, everybody wants it because of Dwayne Johnson's involvement. So he's, despite him not being part of the feature, he stayed committed 
to me and Nick in helping tell this story through all these years. So Dwayne first attached the project in 2013. So for 10 years, he and his team have been passionate about telling this story. And he stayed true to his word to help us get it made. So it's been a it's been a joy to work with Dwayne and his team throughout that on the on the doc side and taking a different form. And uh and both stories will be out next year. So oh I know it's gosh. a long explanation to your question about the movie, but that's the bit of the backstory about it and the iteration and how the idea has changed over time and yeah. so on. Wow. Congratulations on getting to this point so far. I Thank know there's you. still more work to be done. Yeah, I appreciate but it. But this labor of love that you talked about, what a journey. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that's it is, really it has been. People, people say, you know, has it been worth it? I don't, I don't know how you evaluate worth, right? Worth it to me is keeping the commitment that I made to Nick to honor his friends. Yeah. That's all I cared about, period. Anything that comes with it, any of the accolades, any of the money that's made from it, none of that is important to me. What is important to me is that I made a promise when we set out to do the movies that we would try to do it right and honor their memories and and so on. And that's the gratifying part to me. And so um, if, if in the release of these movies, if they get critical acclaim, if they get awards, that's wonderful. I think that'd be great, right? And that, that's, that's something that all of us as the, the people behind it, I'm sure, will be, will be grateful for. But it's not why we're doing it, yeah. despite having you know, award-winning directors attached and screenwriters and so on. It's, it's really to, to honor their memories and... Uh, and I, I hope that at the end of the day that everybody um, who sees this will walk away and say that was accomplished. Wow. Fascinating. Um, well, everybody listening, watching, go read the book, go watch the movie next year when it comes out, not without hope. Rick, thank you so much for coming on the Influence podcast today, sharing your story, sharing advice on um, how we can build out uh, our, our agencies and, uh, and sharing your stories about not without hope and, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and all that stuff. Welcome. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. For sure. This has been amazing. How can our listeners, viewers connect with you um, or French West Vaughn? Yeah, I mean, um, they can, they can, um, French West Vaughn is fwv-us.com to our website and uh, social media channels. Uh, you know, people can opt in and follow some of the things that we're doing. Same thing with, uh, with the film, um, uh, Pre-Productions is my film and television production company. We've got four or five other projects and movies that we're working on and TV shows and so on. So we try to post and keep things updated there. So they can connect through both of those uh, those portals or you know, they can reach me through the agency. And I, I try to be responsive to people and yeah. do the best I can to get back to them and thank them for reaching out. So Awesome. Thanks, Rick. And thank you for listening and watching the EarFluence podcast. If you're interested in full-service podcast production, audio or video podcast production, contact us. We're EarFluence.com and you can follow along on social where we're at EarFluence Media. I'm Jason Gillikin, CEO of EarFluence, and you've been listening to the EarFluence podcast. Podcast.